Hi, and welcome to CAN TV. I'm Dr. Christopher Pena, the scientific liaison for cancer education at the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I'm Dr. Megan McKenda. I'm the assistant director for cancer education, also at UChicago um, Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, Chris and I are here with a group of students from the Research Start program, which is the cancer research training program for high school students. It's a multi-institutional program, so our students um, come and work all summer long in the research groups of cancer research faculty at the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois in Ur Urbana-Champaign, the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Northwestern University. Right. So today's episode is part two of a four-part series, and in this episode you're going to meet students who are working really hard at the University of Chicago on some really exciting innovations and educational methods in cancer research. We know that there are a lot of people in the CAN-TV audience who have been touched in some way by a cancer-related disease. So we think it's really important to let our communities know about the amazing work that's going on right here in Illinois to help improve the ways in which we prevent cancer, diagnose cancer, treat cancer, and also deal with some critical issues such as cancer health disparities and health equity. So we are incredibly thrilled to introduce you to some very talented young people who as high schoolers will be contributing in many meaningful ways in the fight against cancer. So you are about to meet the newest and brightest generation of cancer researchers and clinicians. And I see they're ready to go, so All I'll right, say goodbye so. and make some room. All right, let's have them aboard here. So we are Research Start. We're a program for high school students that want to do biomedical research, particularly in the cancer field. We're housed out of several universities in the Chicagoland area, including the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, Northwestern University, and the University of Illinois in Chicago. So I'm here with my first two guests, Kelly and Ishar. How are you guys doing today? Um, I'm good. How are you? Good, good, good. Good too. Awesome. So we'll start with you, Kelly. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, so hi, I am Kelly Duong, and I am a rising high school senior at Buffalo Grove High School. I'm hoping to one day go to medical school, and I intern with Dr. Benjamin Shogun, working with the gut microbiome. So that word microbiome sounds really interesting. What is that exactly? Um, so the microbiome is a community of trillions of microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses um, that play a vital role in human functioning. It stimulates the immune system, breaks down toxic food compounds, and also um, synthesizes certain vitamins and amino acids. It's kind of like another organ in our bodies, and it can influence bodily processes such as protecting our body from pathogens. The microbiome is consisted of pathogenic and probiotic bacteria, which coexist in a healthy body. However, if there is a disturbance, such as prolonged use of antibiotics or surgery, the body can become more susceptible to disease. So, being that this is a cancer-related uh, topic today, um, the microbiome has to affect cancer in some way. So, can you tell us how it does that, and specifically cancers like colorectal cancer, which are common in the gut? Well, um, colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in the world, and um, patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer usually undergo surgery for treatment. Mm -hmm. And while surgically removing the tumor can be an effective treatment, the presence of harmful bacteria um, can prevent healthy tissue from growing and healing correctly, especially when your intestines have to be reconnected. So what do these harmful bacteria actually do? Well, some bacteria release collagenase, which is an enzyme that breaks down connective tissue, um, especially in the intestine. So for my project, um, we are determining how the microbiome changes before and after bowel prep, which is this standard procedure that, whole, um, that cleans the gut microbiome before uh, colon surgery. All right. So how are you actually collecting this data? Well, first, our lab receives um, human tissue and stool samples from patients in the hospital. Then we process and freeze the, t uh, the samples in glycerol um, to preserve the microbiota. Then we run some assays and we measure the growth of bacteria um, by looking at the optical density of the substance over a full 24 hours. We measure antibiotic resistance bacteria and collagenase bacteria. So after you get this data, what are you going to do with it? Well, ultimately, the goal of my project is to determine the potential um, the microbiome has to degrade collagen and um, uh, promote um, post-complications um, such as infection due to antibiotic resistance bacteria in patients undergoing surgery. The, um, then we will use the data to develop novel strategies to decrease patient morbidity after colon surgery. 
All right. Well, thank you, Kelly. This sounds like it's going to be really helpful for people that um, have different types of gut cancers. So uh, looking forward to see what happens with that. Ishar, welcome. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing? So, hey, guys. I'm Ishar Ganeshan. Uh, I go to the Illinois Math and Science Academy. And this fall, I'll be a senior. Now, uh, this summer, I'll be working in Dr. Lee Ching Yang's lab at U Chicago uh, as part of the Research Start program, and we focus mainly on cancer genetics. Um, and I'm specifically interested in neuroscience, but uh, really, I'm just interested in all of biology. It's a fascinating field. Awesome. So, in Dr. Yang's lab, what exactly are you studying? So, to give you guys some background, uh, my project this summer deals with this genetic phenomenon known as loss of heterozygosity. So, you know how you receive two copies of a gene, one from your uh, mom and one from your dad? So, imagine if one of these genes uh, were lost, and that gene that was lost was essential to stop the growth of cancer. Now, this is loss of heterozygosity, and this type of, uh, this loss of heterozygosity is a driver in many types of cancers. Mm -hmm. So, is there a way for people to find out if they have loss of heterozygosity? It seems like it would be something important for them to know. So, that question actually perfectly segues into the work that I'm doing this summer. And uh, a lot of cancer with loss of heterozygosity has been studied before. And something that I forgot to mention was with these cancers, uh, there's usually uh, allelic increase or decrease. So you have two alleles, and in uh, many patients that have loss of heterozygosity, they'll have more than two alleles or less than two alleles. Now, there's this test known as comparative genome hybridization, which tests for these genomic gains and deletions. But the work that I do over the summer is with something known as copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. Mm -hmm. It's where there's only two alleles, so there's no increase or decrease in uh, the alleles, so a test like comparative genome hybridization won't be able to test for it. Instead, uh, new data has come out, and it's been using this test known as the SNP array to test for copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going through this uh, data, the new data that's been found, and I'm trying to find certain regions in chromosomes for all of these patients where they have hot spots or regions of this copy neutral loss of heterozygosity which may uh, map to genes that are actually drivers of whatever cancer they have. And after we find these genes, we're hopefully going to make precision medicines just so we can treat these genes. So this sounds really interesting in that you can have copy neutral, which sounds normal, but it's still loss of heterozygosity. Yeah. So how exactly do you get that? So. The way that you get copy neutral loss of heterozygosity is this is through this process known as UPD. Now UPD stands for uniparental disomy, and um, what happens is uh, you get two of the same chromosomes from one parent, but zero chromosomes from another parent. So this usually happens in errors in meiosis, and this uh, this error often allows you to have cancer. Like for example, uh, in retinoblastoma, you have the RB1 gene, which would be flawed. Now you'd get two of these flawed RB1 genes from one parent and zero of the functional RB1 genes from the other parent, which will then lead to cancer in this patient with retinoblastoma. Wow. So that sounds incredibly interesting. Thanks for, for sharing that with us. Um, so, I guess we'll uh, go ahead and proceed with our next guest. Again, we are Research Start. We are a program for high school students that want to do biomedical research in cancer biology. Um, we're housed at the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, uh, Northwestern, Northwestern University, and um, the University of Chicago. So, I'm here with my next two guests. This is Bridget and Maggie. And you guys are going to talk a little bit more about the educational side of things, so education, um, educating patients. So we'll start with you, Bridget. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and the work you do? Um, well, I'll be a rising first year at Emory University next year. Mm -hmm. I'm studying neuroscience and behavioral biology as well as nutrition. This summer, I'm a research assistant in the Lindau Lab. So what do you do in the Lindau Lab? Um, so this summer, I'm actually doing clinical-based research. For my project, I'm investigating the best way to ask patients questions about their social determinants of health. We're really hoping to better understand how patients feel being asked these kinds of questions and whether or not their question wording makes sense. So 
you mentioned social determinants of health. What is that, if you can elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, so social determinants of health are essentially someone's social and economic needs. Some examples would be food security, access to transportation, housing security, um, ability to afford utilities, and safety, which are actually the five we're studying in my project. And in the past, uh, these social determinants of health haven't really been addressed in the clinical setting. Mm -hmm. However, there is increasing evidence of the um, importance of these factors and that they have a great influence on health. Great. So what exactly are you using to screen patients for social determinants of health, among other things? Yeah, so after recruiting patients, I give them a survey, which is actually part of a multi-site study uh, based out of the University of California in San Francisco. The survey is about 15 minutes and it's very in-depth. It gives us a really great understanding about what areas of need patients in our populations have and whether or not they're comfortable discussing this um, with their doctors. And then once I finish all of my data collection, I'll be able to understand the connection between social determinants of health and other factors like income, race, mm -hmm. gender, and education. So specifically, how does that relate to cancer? Um, good question. So I'm actually recruiting subjects in several different clinics, mm -hmm. one of them being the hematology oncology clinic, which is where cancer patients will go. And that way I'll be able to understand what specific social needs cancer patients have and kind of compare them to the population with non-cancer patients. Great. And so what do you expect to do this really in the long term? Um, I would say in the long term, the biggest goal is really just to increase education. Mm -hmm. This is for both medical personnel as well as the actual patients. Um, on the clinical side, we want to help doctors better understand the needs of their patients so that they can begin to address them and really improve their care. Mm -hmm. But on the patient side, we're hoping to educate patients about where they can go nearby to fulfill their unmet social and economic needs. And in our study, we're doing this by providing every participant a free packet mm -hmm. with a comprehensive list of nearby um, resources and organizations. So I think you brought a copy of this uh, packet for us. So let's go ahead and here you go if you want to show uh, what that sort of looks like there. Yeah, so this is the packet that we give every mm -hmm. research participant. And as you can see, there are different categories like financial assistance, food and nutrition, mm -hmm. and then there are different ones inside like um, financial assistance or housing, um, which is really great. And mm -hmm. in, in each category, we have different locations and they have phone numbers, the website, different like the languages they use there, the distance, fees pretty much everything that patients might want to know about their resources. Thanks for uh, showing that to us. Yeah, so uh, it sounds really great. Maggie, you're also working a little bit on sort of this educational and outreach mm -hmm. side. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about who you are and um, some of the stuff you're working on. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Pena. Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie Chow, and I'll be a senior this year at Nutra High School. Um, I'm really interested in the human aspects of science, so I'm hoping that med school will be on the horizon for me. And I'm working with Dr. Tara Henderson, a pediatric oncologist this summer, and I'm located in the Pediatric Clinical Trials Office. So a lot of my work has to do with pediatric cancers and the clinical trials associated with them and genetic counseling. Wow. So what exactly have you been working on? So um, I've been working on a lot of interesting things. Um, there's a lot, so with clinical trials, there's a lot of different things about um, consenting, getting approval from your institutional review board. So there's a lot of these things, and it's educating patients on what their impact of participating in a clinical trial could be. And yeah, it's a lot of just ed educating patients and other physicians about what they could be doing and per uh, part par participating in um, a new and innovative trial and how that could help others in their conditions. Great. Yeah. You also mentioned genetic counseling, so mm -hmm. why don't you t uh, talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So the human genome was fully sequenced in 2003, and with this breakthrough opened a whole new sect of science called genomics. So genetic counseling is a service that falls under genomics, and it analyzes a participant's DNA mm -hmm. um, to uncover which genes or which mutations are part of his or her genome. 
um, and the health risks and implications that it would that these genes would code for. So, for example, trisomy 21, which some people might be familiar with, is more commonly known as Down syndrome, and that happens when a baby is born with three copies of the 21st chromosome instead of just two. And as for cancer. Um, there are also genes that can predict a greater uh, likelihood of developing a cancer. So, for example, there's the BRCA1 gene, which um, increases your likelihood of developing breast cancer, and there's also TP53, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And when that gene goes awry, then it suppresses its ability to suppress tumors. So that's kind of like a double negative, but it's like when you take your foot off the pedal, so your cells just keep on dividing unchecked. So genetic counseling can really help uncover these secrets in our DNA. So it sounds really great. Why isn't everybody doing genetic counseling? I know, it's a real bummer, but, um, but it's just really new. So because the entire genome was sequenced in 2003, it's only been 16 years. Oh. So in these 16 years, a lot of new breakthroughs have been happening. Um, people are really thinking about how we can make this something that's meaningful to patients, to the greater population. Um, but because it is so new, there's not that many people that have been able to invest time and their efforts into this field. So for example, the biggest problem is access. So if you just think about it, because it's so new, maybe there's only two certified genetic counselors right now in the state. So because there's not that many, these, there, there's a lot of people that want this service, but there's only two counselors. So then there's the cost, supply and demand. There's only two counselors. It's very in demand, but the supply is low. So cost drives up and a lot of patients won't be able to afford it. There's convenience. These two genetic counselors might be located in the hub of the city, in the urban places where a lot of people are, but then that means the rural uh, patients would have a harder time to be able to access these counselors and services. And probably the biggest is awareness because mm -hmm. not only do patients um, not know that genetic counseling is something that can help them, but their primary care physicians are also not yet exposed to this great field because it is so new. So, you, you know, you had mentioned some of these barriers t towards genetic counseling. How can you sort of resolve them? Yeah, for sure. I'm so glad to, you asked. Um, there's this new idea called telegenetics, and that works to expand genetic counseling services mm -hmm. to survivors through innovative delivery uh, methods by phone call or video conference. So by bringing the idea of remote connection, that means that a patient can be in a rural area, but they can be connected directly to a genetic counselor by phone, by video conference, so that um, they can bridge that gap between them and get rid of issues like the um, access, the convenience, and also because of this specific program, telegenetics, because the idea is that the patients have to work with their primary care physicians to get connected to these services. It takes care of the issue of cost or insurance, and it promotes that kind of discussion between the patient and their primary care physician about maybe this is something that can help me. Okay. Well, that sounds like a really interesting concept. Thanks yeah. for sharing that with Thanks us. Thanks so much, Dr. Fania. Awesome. Cancer research is so fun, so always happy to share. Great. Thank yeah. you. So, again, we are Research Start. We're a program for high school students that is based um, out of several institutions in the Chicagoland area, including the University of Chicago, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, the University of Illinois, the uh, University of Illinois in Chicago, and Northwestern University. I am here with my last guest, Kate Stack. Welcome. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Kate Stack, and I'm a rising high school senior who goes to Glenbrook South High School. I am interested in medicine and biomedical engineering, and I am currently working under a radiation oncologist named Dr. Asan. Really? So what does Dr. Asan do as a radiation oncologist? Yeah, so a radiation oncologist is a doctor who specializes in the treatment of cancer by using radiation. Radiation targets um, cells in a specific area of the body, while chemotherapy is systemic, which means that it travels throughout the bloodstream. Okay. You know, you mentioned radiation. Are there different types, or is there just like one type? Yeah, so there are two main types of radiation. The first type is called external beam radiation. Mm -hmm. So I have a photo of what the treatment process looks like. Oh, great. Let me pull that up right here. So this is a linear accelerator machine. So patients will lay on a flat table with the machine hanging above them. The process is very similar to receiving an x-ray. The radiation beam um, is invisible to the patient, and the process is painless. 
The other type of radiation is called internal beam radiation. Mm -hmm. So with internal beam radiation, the radiation is delivered by radioactive seeds directly near the site of the cancer cells. This can be extremely beneficial to help minimize tissue damage to normal organs. Great. So um, what is your specific research involved then? Yeah, so my research um, focus is a lot on patient education, but also I primarily focus on internal radiation, also known as brachytherapy. Brachytherapy um, is used to treat a range of cancers, but Dr. Hassan focuses on endometrial cancers. Okay. So I have a photo okay. with an example of a endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. So this would be an example of two different tumor types. Mm -hmm. So our goal for the project is to improve patient education for women going through the internal radiation. We want patients to better understand their diagnosis and the treatment process. Right. So why don't you tell us why education is so important? Patient education is extremely important. Uh, cancer can be a very scary diagnosis and the treatment process can seem incredibly daunting. Our goal is to help make the process a little less scary and also help patients understand the treatment in the context of their own cancer. So how are you trying to improve it exactly? So in order to help improve it, uh, Dr. Hassan and other researchers developed a brochure that almost looks like a comic book. The brochure has visuals explaining the different steps of the radiation process, but also phone numbers and other information that patients can use for support. Right. So uh, how, what does uh, the survey actually involve? Yeah, so in order to help see if the brochure is effective and also understand what patients would like to see, we developed two surveys. So one is a pre-survey. So after the doctor gives the patient information about the radiation therapy process, patients are given a pre-survey with questions involving how long the treatment appointment will last and how many people are in the treatment room, etc. And then after that, patients are shown the brochure with the visuals and they are given a post-survey, mostly to see how much they learn from the brochure and if they feel any more comfortable with the treatment process. Um, we also have qualitative questions mm -hmm. to help understand what patients would like to see from us. So we have questions involving what makes up a supportive healthcare team, do you feel supported by your healthcare team, and if there's anything we can do to make the process more comfortable. Great. So are you doing any other kind of research uh, this summer? Yeah, so um, along um, with researchers and other doctors at UChicago and UIC, we are beginning to research advanced stage leiomyosarcomas, which are cancers of the uterus. So I have a picture of an example of the pathology from a leiomyosarcoma, also known as LMS. So a sarcoma is a type of uh, cancer that grows in the smooth muscle, and in this case, it is smooth muscle of the uterine wall. Great. Well, that sounds incredibly interesting, Kate. Thanks for uh, sharing that with us. I think um, we're going to keep you here and bring somebody else, but um, one last thing. We're, our research start, we are a program for high school students that want to do uh, cancer-related research, and we are based out of several institutions in the Chicagoland area, including the University of Illinois at Chicago, the University of Chicago, the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and Northwestern. So I think to conclude, welcome back, Maggie. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like to ask both of you and get your thoughts. What has this program meant for you this summer in terms of growing um, what you want to do academically after high school? Um, one thing that I've really loved about the program is that we have weekly guest and faculty lectures. So we're exposed to a wide range of topics and research, but also different career paths and other positions as well. Great. Yeah, same for me. I It's amazing because we have speakers who have a variety of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of MDs, PhDs. Um, there's others like Dr. Andrea King, who is a psychologist about addiction, which is completely, is so cool. And there's just a lot that we get to be exposed to. Our lab placements are uh, very educational spaces. Um, for example, me, I get to go to the clinic sometimes and kind of meet these patients. So I mentioned how I'm interested in the human aspect. Then that really brings me face to face to some of the things that I've always been really interested in. Great, yeah. awesome. So I think uh, one last thought about the program for both of you. Uh, yeah, so this program has meant a lot to me. I sometimes feel like it's almost my dream job, and it's been amazing to try things that I wouldn't have the chance to until I was in college or even med school. Wow.
Yeah, same here. I think I would encourage everyone who might be interested, who doesn't know if they're interested or not, to just come try it out. Because not only do you get exposure to cancer research, but you get exposure to the entire, like, the entire sect of academia and just what it's like to be a researcher and to have that experience. So I think it's so great to be exposed so early on and everyone should give it a try. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you guys so much for, for coming by. Um, that concludes our show. Again, we are Research Start. We are a program for high school students that want to go into biomedical research, particularly in the cancer field. Um, we are located out of several institutions within the Chicagoland area, including University of Chicago, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, University of Illinois Chicago, and Northwestern University. So thank you all for tuning in. And to Kate, Maggie, Ishar, Bridget, and Kelly.